All right, looks like we're on the air. All right, um, well, good evening. Welcome to the April 25th uh, meeting of the Town Council of Finance Committee. We're gonna be having a couple different meetings tonight. The first one's going to be the Finance Committee meeting. Uh, first item on the agenda, um, opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on uh, the issues for the Finance Committee? Seeing no one, uh, moving on. Um, so tonight, the uh, one item on our agenda is just wrapping up uh, any finance committee discussions of the uh, proposed budget. Uh, so with that introduced, uh, does anyone have anything that they want to raise or discuss relating to the budget tonight? Which budget? Uh, the, either, either the this, this, this school or the, the uh, finance committee budget. And keep in mind then we'll also be having a public hearing, um, <coughs> presumably, uh, on May 6th. So, Penny? Um, I have just a couple of uh, things relative to the pro forma and the um, Special funds. municipal budget. Yes. Um, my question is, um, and we have uh, what a hundred and forty-five thousand dollar gen generator in our municipal budget, correct for a municipal building? For uh, for the Thomas Memorial Library and for Pond Cove, uh, for the so the that one forty-five is is money for a portion of the school one and uh, and then the Thomas Memorial and, and the full, Library. Yeah, and the full, the full amount for the TML. Mm -hmm. It's 100 for the, uh, the school property and then roughly 45 at the TML based on estimates that we've had for, uh, for the okay. TML generator. Okay, I just needed to clarify that. The other thing is... Um, Can I jump in on that? Thing? You may. Uh, through the chair. Um, one of the things that uh, we had talked about at the um, um, joint subcommittee level <clears throat> was, you know, where there are opportunities on projects like this to um, stop doing them as discrete individual projects and where there were opportunities to gain efficiencies and cost savings and, you know, just overall um, collaboration. This, this one stood out as one that, um, you know, was, was tailor-made for that. So there's yeah. a, a need for both and rather than do them separately. Yeah. Um, so. yeah. Once I got clarification, I thought that that's mm -hmm. where it was headed. Um, the other thing is, is that, um, and I just want to say, because I don't think this will be a surprise to anybody, I am a, a pay and display proponent, and I also uh, am cautious about putting dollars in a budget that are projections that um, we have no trends on. And so I get kind of nervous about that when I see the 300,000 and I think that you were fairly conservative when you, you put that number in there. But if you could kind of uh, maybe help people understand how we came up with that number because uh, what, could, what could happen if that isn't realized is some other shifting may have to occur. And so what is the contingency if those targets aren't hit? If I may, through the chair. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was specifically conservative, uh, for one, thinking about if, the, if A, if it does, it, the council needs to take action first, so I don't want to get up, uh, beyond my skis, so to speak. Uh, but due to council, to, to council request to include an estimate for revenue, that's why that was placed in the pro forma, specifically as a separate line as well, so you could see that it would plug in. Uh, thinking about that, uh, if the implementation takes place this summer, we may be looking at, you know, if it rolls in, starting with July 1, but uh, I was thinking about this the other night, you know, as I'm going through all the different, I guess you could call the different scenarios that could take place uh, within, within the situation. Like, oh, that's not going to be annualized. Yes, it, but it will, because if, let's say it starts on July 1. We get July, August, September, October. Oh wait, it's a fiscal year. May, June of 20. 
Okay. So it does become an annualized income at that point. So I, th I think that's a safe estimate. It is conservative. I'm hoping that it's it's very conservative, but uh, but it specifically was conservative. So that's why uh, looking at the estimates that were pl provided by the by the RFP response and what uh, analysis that was performed by the. Uh, Fort Williams Park Committee's sub subcommittee that I was a part of. Uh, I think that that's a that's a conservative but safe safe assumption. Although I hate to use the word assumption, but safe forecast I guess would be a better way to put it. Are there contingencies if it isn't realized? If it's not realized, I think there's a there's an area that we could look at uh, as far as I mean, unassigned fund balance to close the close the gap would be the area, or we could look at other areas we could curtail spending as well to offset that in other areas. If we looked at that and said, okay, we did the, we did not realize something uh, that we had, and if we had spending, we could curtail it to Fort. I would probably look at that first and foremost, because in many ways the revenues from that would be used towards offsetting mm -hmm. that. So we'd have, to, we'd have to look at a combination of different areas we could cut at, it would be probably my first, first way to look at it. Any other questions or points of discussion? Councillor uh, Devereaux. Um, first, I, I don't know that we spoke about it too much last night about the needs assessment. It is a large number. And I just wanted to point out for people that um, maybe aren't aware of it, uh, Council, Councillor Garvin and I were part of the needs assessment committee for the school, with the school. Quite a few people were on that committee. And it was voted um, unanimously, all of us, including myself and Mr. Garvin, voted um, for the needs assessment. We saw it as imperative for our schools after attending the meetings, seeing the um, deferred maintenance in the schools, seeing um, a lot of the issues, some of them safety issues that weren't needed in the 70s and 80s that are really needed now that we need to have in place to bring our schools up to date. This assessment's really, really important. And so even though it's a really large number, I'd like the Cape residents to know that um, it was, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at it from all the different angles and all of us really believe that it's um, very important and an important part of um, this budget. Uh, with that said, I, it is concerning to me that we're increasing taxes. We're looking at a 5% increase. We've increased them three years in a row now, about 5% for the school, school budget. And so my question to you, um, Matt, is, is that sustainable? Is there, and I believe that our school budget is um, very well thought out. It's, they've spent a lot of time. We have an amazing school district, one of the top rated schools in the state. I think that um, the funding is not extravagant at all. I'm, I'm very much for it. However, I also see that um, we have a lot of residents who may not have children in the schools, may not have any connection with the school any longer. And um, here we are raising taxes again for a school budget. Can you talk a little bit about that? Are there other form, is there, is there another way? I realize that the state cut funding and that's part of the, the difficulty that we face. However, is it sustainable for us to increase taxes by 5% every year, or are there other things that we can do? Uh, it's a huge challenge. And one of the takeaways I had from Monday when I was up, at, up in Augusta testifying in support of the Raise the Floor uh, initiative was that we're not alone. Uh, you know, multiple districts across the state have been facing uh, same challenges that we that we're looking at here being as you know a zero or minimal receiving district uh, so that's one area that I think is an area you'd have to look at to find assistance from the state uh, one of the points that I raised was that 10 years ago the town was receiving roughly 2.4 million dollars in revenue from the state on ED 279 or general purpose aid education now we're roughly at 1.2 or in last year's budget so 
looking at how that has changed over time has made a huge impact and created in many ways a revenue problem for the for the school department. And so ultimately I'd say the town has done just about everything it can to try to provide relief when it comes to seniors, specifically with the, uh, you know, the most recent circuit breaker program that was established here, uh, so that helps. Uh, the state circuit breaker program helps some, but it's a challenge because it's, it's not as great as what you may look at or what you looked at over, that, over the past decade in changes in revenue from the state level. So I would maintain my push on that side of it. Uh, as far as sustainable, that's ultimately comes down to what the council's decision is, where they want to see, uh, and the decisions that the school needs to make and what the community will, will support, I guess, is ultimately where the rubber hits the road. Uh, the good thing is that we, I think the town and the school work together to try to solve that problem collectively, uh, but I'm afraid I don't have a, a, an answer to how we can generate more revenues, at least on the, from the school side. On the town side, I think, you know, the council's looking at a serious remedy by, or at least a, one serious tool by looking at the Ford as a revenue generator to at least help the, the big picture. So I think that's that's the opportunity that, that you may have uh, to help, help on the revenue side of the equation to offset the impact of diminishing revenues from other sources such as revenue sharing and general purpose aid education. So that's probably the best answer I can, I can give you. Thank you, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Can I go ahead, go ahead, No, you go ahead. I was gonna go switch ahead. gears, so you. <laughs> what? I was gonna switch gears a little bit. So okay. okay. Councillor Jordan then, yeah. Um, just to respond to Val, um, I looked at the school budget um, uh, for several days and last night's presentation kind of solidified it for me. Um, I, I look at several things. I, I see the uh, increase on the municipal side as a challenge as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, um, it's, a, it's a bigger increase than I have seen in um, a few years. And I look at the school and I look at the town and I look at like um, any entity, your salaries and benefits are a significant part of, uh, of the budget. Mm -hmm. And so then you look at what do we work with from there. And I don't think we can allow our schools, buildings, um, et cetera, to uh, continue to deteriorate. It'll just cost us more and more and more money. And if we don't address it, then we will be faced with building new buildings versus renovating buildings, which is a significant expense. Um, I also see that what's facing the town is a transition to a more full-time uh, fire and rescue, and that's going to be a significant investment, I would think, over the next five years, and that's something we need to look at very seriously. So when I look at the tax increase and I, I think about where are the places where we may be able to reduce um, uh, a little bit. Um, I'm going to look to hear from the citizens at the public hearing to see if they can help shed some light on how they might look at it. Because I see the due diligence that the school um, board members and superintendent did, and I see the due diligence that uh, uh, Matt and company have done, and um, I think I'm looking to the citizens to dive in a little more and give some advice on what they might consider, because there's a lot of moving parts right here in this town, mm -hmm. and these budgets are addressing those moving parts, so anyway. Councillor Randall? Um, I can wait if anyone else wanted to chime in on that particular issue. Uh, Councillor Garvin? I just wanted to, uh, so Councillor Devereaux, you were talking about a 5% increase. I want to make sure we're all using the same reference points and vocabulary and things like that because the total 
um, combined municipal and school budget um, tax rate increase as we're looking at it right now is 3.9%. So, 4%, so basically. Um, which, and you know, there's, there's the different components that, that comprise that, but um, while expenses on both sides, both school and home uh, and municipal are up, um, uh, I think greater than they were last year, um, because of the revenue projections, the, the overall impact to the, to the taxpayers is lower. So, and I think if you look back on um, an annualized basis, um, it reflects actually a fairly average um, adjustment year over year. So um, I do agree with Councillor Jordan that, and, uh, and this is something that, you know, we've been talking about for a long time, is that, um, you know, not only is there a need to make sure we're maximizing revenues wherever we can, but also make sure that for the expenses that we do have, we're, we're as efficient as we can be with those, but also be mindful in our planning of what's coming down the pike. So, you know, this year it was the, you know, having deferred the school, um, uh, renovation study from last year when the hit would have been greater last year. So, um, you know, that was a, a, a decision that was made in the interest of pushing that up. On the municipal side, as Councilor said, we're, we're going to have other things that come steamrolling at us too. I mean, we're going to be doing a, you know, a townwide revaluation in the next couple of years. We're going to be, you know, looking at adjustments to staffing on the fire side. There's other things in the capital plan that, you know, we're going to be as much of a victim of this as the schools have been for the last couple of years. So, um, you know, the, the reality is is that, you know, it's a constant struggle to balance what are the services we deliver with what's the cost of providing those services. And, you know, from my perspective, the citizens have spoken pretty clearly about what their, what their priorities are, where those services stand. So, but I, uh, my main point was just making sure that as we're talking about numbers, because there's, you know, what's the expense increase? That's one number. What's the, you know, net to taxes increase? And then ultimately, what is the tax increase? Um, and so for this year, it's 3.9 as currently proposed. Anyone else on this topic? Uh, so I'll just chime in very briefly. Um, in addition to what's been said, I think what we're seeing is we're dealing with what are in effect national problems at our local level. And that's the, 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 the dilemma because there's no way for us to fix them. We just have to, we, uh, for example, health insurance. A big driver here is the health insurance costs, which as everyone knows is a national problem. Um, as our employee health costs are going up, uh, the way the contracts are currently structured, we end up having greater than 5% increases in that category, which raises up the overall expenses. At the same time, the rate of inflation, or the, uh, the consumer price index component for um, K-12 to education has been growing uh, at double-digit numbers for the last decade or so. So our rate of uh, cost inflation for education is actually lower than the national level, as near as I recall. So um, it's unfortunate, but it's a national problem that we're experiencing. Uh, we as a society here in Maine, we, we have a couple different ways to pay for this. We can use property taxes, sales tax, and income tax. And we as a society have chosen to primarily fund these schools through property taxes. And because of that, unless at Augusta we decide to shift those around, it's ultimately gonna be a property tax problem. Um, and I think a key point that uh, Councilor Garvin made is we're going to be doing a revaluation soon. What's happened over the last few years since our last revaluation is certain regions in the town have become very popular and the value of that property has risen significantly. Um, the way that all of those moving components work is when, uh, until there's a revaluation, because of the fact that our town is very popular to be in and our property values have risen, uh, the state is cutting our aid. But if someone on one side of town's property goes from being worth half a million dollars to a million dollars, until you revalue, everyone else is in effect subsidizing uh, their property taxes. So with the revaluation, we're gonna see regions of the town where property taxes are gonna go up significantly, far more than they've seen from these budget increases. And you're gonna see other areas of the town where presumably they're gonna actually see their property taxes decrease. And then we're gonna have some level of equity and fairness as that revaluation happens. And when that happens, people will see that their overall um, 
tax rate is going to drop. But at the end of the day, we still have, the state has said that if we, it's in effect a wealth tax. The state has said that if you have a house, you bought it for 100,000, we now think it's worth half a million dollars, um, we're gonna impose a wealth tax on you. And we're gonna use that to fund the schools. And it's unfortunate, Some, at the national level, people say, oh, we'd like a wealth tax. But then at the local level with property valuations and property taxes, it's not so much fun. But that's in effect what it is. And that's what we're dealing with. And it's unfortunate because just because your property has gone from 100, thousand to a half a million doesn't mean you can afford to pay those costs and it seems wildly unfair that you'll be pushed out of a home that you've had for 30 years or out of a community you've been embedded in for your entire life just because they've said oh your property's worth more but unless we change the way we allocate costs at Augusta it's the way everything's structured and we're in effect stuck with it unless we can rein in expenses which we've been doing as the best we can um, it, it, the revenue side of things, we're now looking around. We've brought in uh, uh, a new individual with a good amount of experience that will hopefully help us look at things. <laughs> Somewhere in this room. <laughs> Uh, come up with creative ways to, to increase revenue. And then we're also looking, obviously, at Fort Williams, um, as the town manager noted. Um, ho we're hoping th those numbers are somewhat conservative um, with what we can generate. But between it all, it's unfortunate. I completely hear you that the, it's not sustainable, um, but it, it's something that we're stuck with for the time being, and we're doing all we can. So. Sorry for being so long-winded there, uh, Councillor Garvin. Thanks, and just to close, I had been looking while we were talking about, so last year our, our approved tax increase was 6.6%. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is significantly less than that. Um, so I, I think overall, looking longitudinally, um, I mean, I, <coughs> I'm encouraged by the number this year um, because of where we are. So albeit mindful of the a lot of the things that we have coming towards, you know, I had had a conversation with Matt uh, following one of our meetings and, you know, there was a sense of like, oh, wow, th this is great. I said, well, it's, it's great for this year, but there's a lot more, you know, coming down the pike that we have to be aware of. Um, so, anyway. I'll if I may. Uh, just a couple of things that have changed over the period of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the whole budget season that have made a, an impact in a positive manner uh, was from the initial budget presentation to now uh, was consolidation of you know, a, a joint purchase with the school department for a bus that they're looking to purchase this year, as well as some large capital items that we're looking to purchase, but we're now looking to do that through a lease purchase agreement. So what that ends up doing is having a positive impact this year as far as a, a large number expenditure, but also allowing the asset that's being used to being paid for at the time that's being used, so to speak. So that's kind of, uh, that's been a bit of a change that we've put in over the past couple of years. And I think that's been a positive result to, uh, to the taxpayers. Uh, we, where we originally started out, we had a, a, a higher, obviously a higher mill rate increase as, as well as a higher percentage increase to the tax rate, but now at 3.9%, I think we're in, you know, the budget as it's bring, being brought forward from both the town and the school side has, has resulted, you know, has resulted in a, in a, you know, that reduction, which has been a good thing. Uh, the other item that we have on there is, yeah, we're plugging in the income or anticipated income from the, from the fort, and then uh, I just want to let people know that the anticipated mill rate at 1976 the 74 cents change that you're looking at, the impact that that has is basically about $74 for every 100,000, or let's say it's uh, $148 for a $200,000 house and $222 for say a $300,000 house. And a median home in town is roughly about $350,000. So you're looking at probably about a $250 to $275 increase on the taxes. That's as high as it's going to be, and the reason why I'm saying it at this point in time is the legislature is still in session, and there are still discussions as far as what the towns will be receiving for both education aid as well as uh, as well as uh, revenue sharing. So with those numbers still in play, uh, this is this is still a conservative estimate, I think, as well as the final amount of. Uh, 
municipal value that gets committed when the tax rate actually is set in the summer. So this is what we're looking at here is, is estimated as the highest rate that it will be. Uh, so it could be less. Uh, as it was last year as well. Uh, we came out of the box with a higher mill rate than it ultimately came down to due to growth that we picked up because there is a substantial amount of building that's taking place in town with renovations and new homes coming on board as taxable. The estimate that we have for value in the equation right now is a conservative one provided by the assessor. And uh, so that's why we kind of brought that forward. So that's why the tax rate that we're looking at now is probably as high as it will be. It could be less ultimately when the tax bills do go out in, in, you know, towards the end of summer in August. Uh, so I hope that's helpful, at least to, to having an understanding as to, as to where we are and uh, you know, what that impact may be ultimately. But there are two moving parts still and they're, they're revenue sharing and education, education funding that may increase from the state and those are still very much in play there. I don't think they'll decrease, I, I, I've plugged in you know, both the superintendent and myself have plugged in conservative numbers based on the best estimate that they've given us to this point. So I, I hope that's helpful, helpful information. Thank you. Councillor Randall. <laughs> Um, so I, I do have one comment on that discussion, which is that I think as we start to talk about the comprehensive plan and move into next year, we should really think about um, what kind of development people might want to see in the town center and how that might benefit us in terms of revenue. Um, but the comment that I was actually going to make before was I just, um, this year in going through the budget, there were a couple of items that departments were requesting. Um, Public Works was requesting a mower and uh, the police department was requesting a cruiser. I think in the future it would be helpful um, if we could get information as the school board did from the departments outlining whether something's a want or a need because it was a little bit difficult to find out is this something that you need right now or is it something that you would like to have and then the other thing the school board did which I thought would be helpful to us as well is what would be the consequence of your department not getting this. Mm -hmm. So if it's going to meet, so for public works for example, um, they'd also requested another employee. Um, so I think just to sort of visualize, to sort of, for us to be able to play it out, it would be helpful to hear from public works. Um, if you get the employee but not the mower, will it address some of the concerns that arose from having a mower that's smaller and older? Um, just moving forward into next year. And then, and also as we um, start talking about, I know there are some large ticket items that we're going to be talking about and thinking a few years into the future, even in those discussions, it would be really helpful to know what are the priorities. Oh, and one more thing. I did have a concern. Um, someone came to me with a concern about the, the ladder truck that we already purchased. Um, <laughs> And, and this particular individual was concerned that we don't actually need a ladder truck um, in Cape Elizabeth. I don't know the details of what, what's required for a fire department and when, a, when we have to have a ladder truck and when we don't. Um, so I think that that kind of information could go to address some of those uh, concerns that people have. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Quick follow-up on the uh, on the ladder truck replacement. Uh, hoping this will be helpful. Uh, the the apparatus when it ultimately arrives is what they call a quint, and by quint it means it has five functions. Whereas the ladder truck that we have now has really a couple functions. But uh, the reason why we selected that apparatus versus say replacing it with a standard ladder truck that you know multiple departments have purchased is a we saved roughly six hundred thousand dollars just in ticket price alone between you know one, one unit versus the other. The Quint also has the functionality of an engine or what a pumper truck may be. So you've, and the chief could tell you what the five functions are. I can tell you what a five two player is in baseball, but I can't tell you <laughs> all the functions of the ladder truck here. But it does have multiple functions that ultimately we have another engine that will not have to be replaced because we purchased this other item. So. We say we'll save funding on one end from not having to buy just the standard prototype ladder truck that costs about 600 grand more. We're also saving to having to replace one of our other larger apparatus because of the functionality that this device also has. So uh, 
thinking about the taxpayer, in that case, we're, we're roughly a million to a million two to the good uh, by replacing it with the with the device that we did have. So, uh, I guess that's my best answer I can put on that. I, and I hope the person that asked is listening. Uh, I hope so you, too. I, I told him I promised I wouldn't mention his name. He yeah. asked for anonymity. But if you want to bring it back, or if you want to have him give me give me a call too, I'd be happy to discuss it. As the chief would probably be even better, but. The long-term result is we're saving a lot of money by by doing that. In you know, it's yeah, it's a much better device and a lot less lot less cost. Any other comments, questions, items for discussion on the proposed budget? Going once, uh, seeing none. Uh, so uh, thank you all for uh, all of your time and commitment on uh, working on the budget and thank you to the town manager and the school board for all the effort that they put in. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentation last night. I thought it answered a, a number of questions for me. Uh, so after this, we're now going to be moving on to, uh, I think first is going to be the special uh, the special meeting of the town council, at which point, uh, presumably, we're going to be setting the, bu uh, the budget public hearing, uh, and then the next item relating to the finance committee after that will simply be the uh, actual vote uh, after the public hearing, where we will be um, adopting the, presumably, uh, pr adopting the municipal budget and the school budget and setting it uh, to uh, school budget validation election tentatively scheduled for June 11th. Uh, so with that, do I have a motion to uh, adjourn the Finance Committee? I so uh, And do we have a second? Second. All, right. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, we're adjourned. <laughs> Okay. Of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance, will you all please rise? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please have the roll call. Chairman Garvin. Here. Councilor Devereaux. Here. Councilor Gabrielson. Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Here. Councilor Randall. Here. And Councilor Straw. Here. Thank you very much. Um, is there anybody here that wishes to speak to something not on the agenda for the special meeting? Seeing none, the two agenda items that we have are to vote to set uh, public hearings um, for uh, the fiscal 20 year, fiscal 2020 year budgets. Um, is there anybody that would wish to speak on item number 76, 2019, uh, the fiscal year 2020 general fund budget motion to set a public hearing? Seeing none, uh, is there a motion to set said public hearing? So moved. Is there a second? Second. The motion on the floor is for a public hearing that will be on Monday, May 6th at 7 p.m. following the Finance Committee meeting at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall on the proposed fiscal year 2020 general fund budget for the town of Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Proposed expenditures of $42,035,485. Estimated non-property tax revenues of $7,911,887 with 34 million one hundred twenty-three thousand five hundred ninety-eight to be raised from property taxes. This budget would result in an estimated tax rate of nineteen point seven six dollars, nineteen dollars and seventy-six per thousand evaluation. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Motion's unanimous. Next item is number 77-2019, the fiscal year 2020 special funds budget, motion to set a public hearing. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none, is there a motion to set the public hearing for the fiscal 2020 special funds budget? So moved. Motion by Councillor Straw, is there a second? Councillor Penelope Jordan, is there any discussion? 
Motion on the floor is to set a public hearing for Monday, May 6, 2019 at 7 p.m. here at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall for the proposed fiscal 2020 special funds budget for the town of Cape Elizabeth, which are included in tonight's agenda. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor? That's unanimous as well. Is there anybody that wishes to speak to anything that was not on the agenda we just went through? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn the special meeting? So moved. Councillor Jordan. Second by Councillor Jordan. Any discussion? All those in favor? All right. So we'll move on to our workshop. Okay. Uh, doesn't matter. Check the uh, camera operator. Oh. I'm waiting for a decision. That's fine. Yep, yeah, we're good. We're just going to have our workshop now. So. Yep, yeah, we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry.